people, I'm Jenny Metherill, I'm a fourth generation witch. Today we're back with my ever popular almanac series looking at what witchcraft you can do when and why for the month of February. As always with these videos, what I like to do is first of all give you a general overview of the witchcraft trends that run throughout the month of February, and then we'll look at the nitty gritty day to day detail and I'll tell you what days you can do which witchcraft on. So with that said, let's start straight in with our overview. So February is the shortest month of the year, thank goodness, because it's also the traditionally the coldest month of the year. I know we are looking towards spring, but it's still bloody cold out there. And um, if you're like me, you object to that slightly. I'm not great with the cold. I'm much better when it starts to heat up. But however, in the Northern Hemisphere, by the end of February, we've gained two extra hours of daylight. And if you look at the lakes and ponds and streams, you'll see them loaded with frog spawn and newts and toad spawn. It is a month of beginnings and a start of everything. I mean, this is of course celebrated by that wonderful Sabbath festival, Imog, which I've done a whole video on. So if you want to watch it, I'll put it up here for you. Go and have a look because it's very good. It tells you all about Imog and how to celebrate it. And therefore, I will only be talking briefly about Imog in this video. By the end of February, the birds are beginning to really start singing in earnest. Violets, those flowers of love, and primroses abound. And especially with this being a leap year, our thoughts and hearts turn to love. It is the month of romance. February really is concerned with the beautiful Candlemas bells, or as we know them, the snowdrop, which is a flower of purity, cleansing and hope for the spring. The old pagan story about snowdrops was when the world was created. The snow was transparent and it went around the world asking all the flowers if they would impart their hues to the snow so it could have some colour. And they all said no, apart from the kindly snowdrop. And so that is why our snow is white. And this is why the snowdrop and snow have been friends ever since, and they appear, in general, together. Yeah. It's quite cute, that story, isn't it? It's a real sweetie. I love the fact that the snow and the snowdrop are friends, because the snowdrop gave the snow its colour. Aww. Aww. The Welsh Celts would use snowdrops in order to purify their homes, and should you bring them in, they're great for cleansing the aura throughout your home. And so I recommend it. It was always considered bad luck to bring snowdrops into your house before Candlemas, but I think this was a Christian adaptation of the pagan habit of bringing snowdrops into your house for cleansing purposes, in order that they could say, you can only do it when we have our purification right. Because, of course, Candlemas, which is on the 2nd of February, is the Christian version of our Imolk, which is a purification ritual. It is very much imbued within February, the rite of cleansing and purification. And in fact, the name February comes from the Roman februa, which means to purify. So we're going to be cleansing all this month. We have spring cleaning to do. We have our self cleaning to do. We also have psychic cleaning, which we must do. It's very important to keep yourself psychically cleansed. And, you know, that's very easily done with a sage stick, an incense stick or a ritual bath. I like the ritual baths actually because I'll have a bath every single day, obviously. So at the end of the day I like to get into my bubble bath and sometimes I think no, I'm going to ritually cleanse. So I light my candles, I put out incense sticks, I pour salt and essential oils, particularly geranium rose, into the bath in order to cleanse myself both psychically and physically. And it works lovely, it's lovely. I recommend it. And February's stone, finally, is amethyst, which is also a great stone of purification. And should you require to purify your other crystals, you can often leave them with amethyst and bong them in a singing bowl like this. And this will help with their cleansing and impart purity and clarity to all your other crystals. Amethyst is really an all-round great crystal. And for those of you starting out, I would always recommend having some amethyst in your 
your collection. It doesn't need to be large. A small chip will do, but it really is the stone of the witch. So February, as I've said earlier, is a month where your thoughts turn to your romantic partner and words of love are very much in the air. This is seen on the 1st of February, which is our first date that we're going to discuss, because this, of course, is Imolk. Imolk is a day of two halves. It's a day of the goddess Bridget and the Saint Saint Bridget. They're both one and the same. You know, throughout the years, they've almost evolved with each other. And so you can't really separate the two, which is fine by me. Bridget was a goddess of fertility, the goddess of the spring. And so therefore, this was celebrated by springly happenings of procreation. Go out, have a lovely time with your partner. And that is a great way to celebrate the goddess. Likewise, wonderful things to do on Imolk is, of course, to celebrate the time of year and honour her with an altar. And I have done so. And if you're a member of Patreon, I tell you all about the symbolism for each object on this altar on that platform. Just go to patreon.com forward slash Ginny Metherill and sign in. It's only a couple of pounds a month. Imolk is a great festival. Celebrate it with your loved one. Rituals of purification rites. And for those of you who have a mind to do so, go up to Huddersfield and check out the Imolk Festival there. It really is quite something. The 2nd of February is the end of Imolk, but also the Candlemas Day, which is the Christian version of Imolk. You know, the rite of purification, and this is where they lit a load of candles, which is what we also do at Imolk, to be blessed by St Bridget. And so I have some candles here, very prettily, and some snowdrops to represent the time of year. It is a day when you were supposed to give a pancake to your cockerel. And if the cockerel pecked at the pancake and then let the hens eat the rest of it up, you would have good fortune for the rest of the year. But if he gobbled up the pancake all by himself, then you were a bit stuck, I think. There was other divination to be had as well, though, with the weather. Weather divination is very important during February, and there is a lot of it. This is one of the first divination days, and if it's set bright and fair today, we will have a bright and fair summer. And if it's foul and wet and windy and rainy, we will have a foul and wet and windy and rainy summer. So, fingers crossed for a dry, fair day. The 9th of February is the night of the new moon. Astrologers believe that each month's moon takes on the star sign that it appears in. This month's new moon is in Aquarius, which is a trailblazing sign, which is great, isn't it? So you should set your plans for the coming month so you give way to all your creativity and passion when thinking about the plans for this month because they will have a really good chance of coming off. It is also the day that the Chinese New Year starts and we're in the Year of the Dragon. And the dragon is also a trailblazing sign. Very quick thinking, very powerful, very successful and full of luck and fortune. You want to be born in the Year of the Dragon. I always think the Year of the Dragon is one of the finest signs to be born in of the Chinese Zodiac. And so Good luck to you. Let me know in the comments below if you were born in the year of the dragon. I wasn't. I was either a pig or a rat. And in fact, I think I spent all my years thinking I was a rat and then realised that my birthday fell before the Chinese New Year started. And so therefore I was actually a pig. Anyway, that's me. The 12th of February is the day that traditionally the catkins appear on the alder trees. It's known that you should take a twig of the alder tree into your home and this will prevent and deter fleas from appearing because of course it is beginning to be flea time of year and someone who such as myself is beloved by fleas, I think you know, if, if the animals have a flea it's going to jump off an animal and bite me and ignore the rest of my family. It's only me who gets bitten because I taste delicious. So I'm taking in a lot of alder catkins today in order to deter them from biting me. The 12th of February is also Collop Monday, which is the day you're supposed to eat collops. I've no idea what a collop is, but have some. Delicious. The 13th of February is therefore Shrove Tuesday. And Shrove Tuesday in this country is known universally as Pancake Day. That's what we do. We ate pancakes and have pancake races. And 
other races. It was really common, and I'm not quite sure why, but the tradition in the UK is to hold village sports. Now, what this would be, would be the sort of towns and villages would get together and the whole town, or the whole village, would play football or hurling, or uh, skipping, or something. And he's quite dangerous, or rugby. And this is not a sport, you know, you join in light-heartedly. There are no rules, no boundaries, and they have to get a ball over into a goalpost of some sort. It's quite energetic and exciting. Whole towns and villages would do this. It's still practised in certain areas of the UK. In the north, they particularly like football-based games, and in the south, we like hurling type games. So, the 12th to the 14th of February are also known as borrowed days. These borrow the days from the month previous. So the 12th to the 14th of February should be really cold and horrid. And this will mean that our summer is going to be hot and warm. Now, however, if they borrow some hot days from January, because this is where the days come from, then we're going to have a terrible summer. So look out 12th to the 14th of February and make sure that we're having a nasty time and shivering by our hearths, because then we're going to have a beautiful summer sun. And now we come to the 14th of February, which is one of the busiest days of February. For those Christian witches out there, it is Ash Wednesday. However, this Ash Wednesday is signified by several strange customs which varying parts of the UK like to enjoy, one of which is Jack a Lent. Jack a Lent is a man made of straw and dressed in old cast off clothes who's paraded around the villages and then he's finally taken to the village square and hung whereupon the villagers may then pelt him with stones and mud and rotten tomatoes to their heart's content. And apparently this has some practice in pagan roots, but nobody knows why. It is also the bird's wedding day. Now, I'm sure you have heard me speak about this before, but it is very sweet. It is traditionally the day when birds choose their mates. So should you wake up on the morning of the 14th and see a bird out of your window or out of the front door or wherever, that bird signifies who you're going to get together with in the future. A blackbird means you'll marry someone charitable. A robin means you'll marry a sailor. A goldfinch, someone rich. A sparrow, someone poor. A duck, you will be homely. It will be a happy and homely marriage, as is a dove. That will be a happy and loving marriage. So there's, I mean, there's millions of them. If you see an owl, I think it's the worst one where, you know, I, I think it's going to end in divorce. I can't remember. But there is a lot of traditions. So watch out for what bird you first see on the morning of the 14th, the bird's wedding day. As we all know, the morning of the 14th is also Valentine's Day, which is when our thoughts turn to love. Valentine's Day is a much, much older feast than the Christians um, give it credit for. They, they say it's all about St Valentine, who, who was a 5th century pagan priest, I think, who was then became Christian. However, it is based on a seriously much older festival, not least of which is dedicated to fertility. And it is a day for fertility. The Welsh would celebrate this by giving their loved one a Welsh love spoon, which is a pure charm. This is witchcraft from the elders. My mother gave me one when I married to Mr Metherell, and I treasure it mightily because it is a very beautiful part of my kitchen decoration. Valentine's Day is also a traditional day for love spells. And here is one that I picked up in a very old book of mine, which I thought I'd read out to you. Should you wish to try it, let me know down below in the comments whether it works. So, take two bay leaves and sprinkle them with rose water. Place them on your pillow. In the evening, when you go to bed, put on a clean nightgown turned inside out. And lying down, say softly, In dreams, let my true love see, and my valentine come to me. And apparently, you're going to get some love. So, there we go. Quite a nice spell, that one, isn't it? Let me know if you do it. The 16th of February this year is known as Kissing Friday, and this is where all my feminist hackles rise up. It was traditional on this day that a man could go out and ask any woman for a kiss, and if she refused him, he was allowed to pinch her bottom. Quite frankly, it would get a bloody great slap round the chops from me if anyone did that to me, I think. Yes, I think it's just dreadful. I don't agree with it. Don't do it, ye men out there. I think it's wrong. 
Obviously, you can ask anybody you like for a kiss, but if they say no, you're not allowed to pinch their bottom. Well, not without their express permission. They might just want their bottom pinched as opposed to a kiss. Hmm. The 20th of February is the night when the sun moves into Pisces. Now, Pisces is apparently governs the feet. And so you should observe the feet in this month. If you have foot related problems, um, you know, take care of them now. The calendar of shepherds, this is an almanac from 1604, will tell you how Pisces behave. The man born under Pisces shall be a great goer, a fornicator, a mocker and covetous. That doesn't sound very nice, does it? He will say one thing and do another. He shall trust in his sapience. He shall have good fortune. He will be a defender of widows and orphans. That's quite sweet. He shall be fearful on water, but he will pass through all his adversities and live until 72. The woman shall be delicious. Familiar in jests, pleasant of courage, fervent, a great drinker. Sounds like me already. She shall have sickness of her eyes and be sorrowful by shame. Needlessly, her husband will leave her. Oh dear, it's not great, is it? And she shall have much trouble with strangers. She shall travel much, have pain in her stomach, and shall live 77 years. But both men and women shall live faithfully. That's quite nice. They can't be that bad. So even though the man is a fornicator, um, he shall live faithfully. So, well, well, I wouldn't mind being married to a faithful fornicator, would you? The 24th of February is the night of the full moon. This is known as the snow moon, the chaste moon, the lent moon, the cold moon again. It's just reflecting all the festivals that are happening around this time. This moon is the first moon of spring, however. And so for this moon, it does have a very special and seed-like energy, which is quite powerful. So I recommend making moon water on this day because you will be using moon water in the weeks to come and it's great for all sorts of different spells and potions. And finally we come to the leap year, the 29th of February. This is a day when traditionally women can propose to men. Um, but if you bought and put on a red petticoat and then flashed it at your suitor before asking them to marry you, they would be so overcome with the red petticoat that they'd say yes. If the suitor refused the offer of marriage from the woman, they had to buy her some new gloves by Easter, presumably to cover up the fact that she didn't get married. The Scots believe that if you are born on the 29th of February is rather unlucky. However, you do have the added benefit of being called a leapling, which I think is rather cute. You're a leapling. And finally, it is thought that broad beans and other such staple crops grow the wrong way in a leap year. But nobody actually knows what the wrong way means in this context. And it was quoted in quite a lot of gardening almanacs right up until the 1900s. So if you know what the wrong way is for a broad bean to grow, well, will you let me know? Because I'd be quite interested. And so that is my almanac for the month. Which part did you like the best? And do you have any traditions that you would like to share with me? If so, leave me a message in the notes below. Don't forget to look at my Patreon, patreon.com forward slash Ginny Metherall. There's plenty on there that you can look at. And otherwise, please don't forget to like and subscribe because that's what I need from all of you good people to help keep me going. I love a subscribing. If you subscribe, it means I can keep making these videos for you. And I will see you next week.